From the heavens to the earth, Off Duty is bringing it all to you today, including a special presentation on these spectacular northern lights. And we're going to do it all right here at New York's American Museum of Natural History. Was that a screaming across the sky? No, it was just the Northern Lights, which are having one of their best years in half a century. We are here right now in the Rose Center for Earth and Space. And to help us understand the science behind the spectacle is Mordecai Mark McLow. He's curator here, and you're also chair of the astrophysics department. The science behind the Northern Lights, they're not just called the Northern Lights. What's their official name? Their Latin name is the Aurora Borealis, which means Northern Lights. Which means the Northern Lights, <laughs> right. And people know it, and people know it often by the Northern Lights. They often wonder sort of, what is it? What causes it? Okay. Well, the Northern Lights is actually one of the major manifestations of the sun and the earth directly interacting. The sun blows a solar wind, gas coming off the sun at a million miles an hour, and that streams through the solar system. It's very hot gas. It starts out at over a million degrees. And all the electrons have been torn off their atoms. So you have electrons and ions streaming through the solar system. If that stuff impacted the Earth's atmosphere, it would be bad news. Right. Luckily for us, the Earth has a strong magnetic field. These charged particles quack into the magnetic field and go around. And that's Whew. producing the colors. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> they get trapped in the magnetic field, come sweeping back much slower by now, and a few of them trickle down the field lines all the way into the Earth's atmosphere. And that very little remnant of the million mile an hour solar wind is still enough to give us all those fancy lights. That's unbelievable. So all that, and it's just sort of that last moment where we're getting these beautiful the, colors. Yes. And are the colors ever, can we predict what they're going to be? We can't predict for any particular aurora, but we understand where the colors are coming from very high in the atmosphere these energetic particles are slamming into oxygen atoms, popping electrons up that are going to come back down towards the nucleus, emit photons, and they're going to be red. Further down, they often collide with other atoms quickly, then we get green out. And we also get blue from nitrogen. Right. So it really depends on exactly where the particles are hitting, what colors and what shapes you're going to get. But what about when they hit Mordecai? Can we ever get a sense of that during the year and yes. predict that? OK, we can't predict it across the year. But what we do know is that anytime there's a big solar flare, the solar wind speeds up, gets a lot stronger. And the next day, when the solar wind gets to the Earth, we get a nice big aurora. So where in the world do you go to watch the world's best light show? Our own Kathleen Squire, she has sussed out the best places on the globe to see the Northern Lights. Let me guess, it's not out my bedroom window? No, Wendy, <laughs> afraid not. Too bad, <laughs> all right. Looks like I'm gonna have to travel a little bit. I'm gonna go to Norway. What's sort of the nicest way I can make this happen? Wendy, picture this. You're on a ship sailing through the fjords, which are nice and calm during this time of year, ice free. Okay. You're sitting in a jacuzzi. You have a glass of champagne in your hand, of course and there's a beautiful light show overhead, the Northern Lights. What about Sweden? If you go to Sweden, and if you're staying at the Ice Hotel, what they'll do, the ice hotel. yes, <laughs> what they'll do is they'll send you up in a nine seat plane to get up close and personal with the lights. A little closer to home, at least here in the US, Canada. What could I do in Canada? This I might actually be able to do. Right, in Canada, you can actually command your own team of dogs for a dog sled and cross the polar landscape with dogs towing the way. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, are you by yourself on a dog sled? Or are you with multiple other people? You're with other people. You're with guides. But during the day, they will train you to lead your own team. So what you're telling me is I'm basically going to have to get on a plane or drive to Canada. Yes. <laughs> yes. We always think we have our own light show here in New York City every day. Not the same as the Northern Lights. Not the same. All right, you set us straight. Thanks so much, Kathleen Squires. Thank you, Wendy. Turning now from the sky into your living room, probably safe to say that some guys don't give a lot of thought to interior design. Our own Kelsey Hubbard is here and she has tips from top designers on how you can man up your living space. Check it out. Let's face it, for many men, interior design is a challenge. But whether you're single or in a relationship, there's no excuse for not personalizing your space. According to designers Courtney and Robert Novogratz, we caught up with a husband and wife team for some tips on how to incorporate some masculine touches into any home. The first step is you get rid of the poster of the dogs playing poker. It's not a good look. 
You can have fun design and masculine design, and even sports theme design if that's what you're into, but it has to have a timeless look, almost a Ralph Lauren look. And what about women's role in this, whether it's your mother if you're not married yet, or right. your girlfriend, do they usually somehow make their thoughts known when it comes to men and interior I, design? I definitely think every man needs some kind of woman's touch, for sure. You can get beautiful masculine type of design within your home. Um, that's beautiful for most, both the male and the female, because um, I know Courtney loves this. So I think, again, it's like these are obviously things I love, but uh, design books, I think, is a great way of bringing art into your home. If you don't have a huge budget, you can buy beautiful design books, photography. This is from Brazil, and this was actually made um, at a natural woods in Brazil. And I don't, it was, I don't think it was just more of a design, but it kind of looked like a football, and that's why I gravitated oh, okay. toward it. But, um, I think travel is a great way of bringing design into your home. If you go on a vacation, um, pick up things, pick up from things from that you really love from markets. local markets. You happen to have sons, and it's interesting how you've taken some of their interests and incorporated that into your design. Tell us how. One son loves basketball, so we incorporated some basketball art into the room for him. Another son is more of a Gen X kid, um, so we found uh, some skateboards over there designed by the artist Damien Hurst. Uh, so he's getting art, he's getting skateboards, and he loves it. So what do you tell your clients when they're trying to bring in all these different aesthetics but the space may be limited? Um, I think you should definitely start with one great piece, whether it's an art piece or a great piece of furniture, and really design around that. So focus on one great piece and then decorate around that and get rid of the junk. All right, so you've got a few masculine pieces you've added in with some design books. Tell us uh, what you've done here. It was by a Parisian artist who took old toy um, Ferraris and then placed the, and embalmed them sort of in uh, Lucite. I also love this skull. Uh, it's old, it's from Paris as well. It's something that both Courtney and I love. And then one fun thing we always do is we incorporate our own kids' art into the space. This is by one of our six-year-old kids. Uh, People always ask who we did, who did it, and we laugh and said our sons. What's most important is that couples enjoy the process of decorating together because you'll get closer. You may have a few arguments, but that's okay. That's what it's about. Now we've been talking to you about free light, but what about free music? The Wall Street Journal's pop and rock critic Jim Fusilli, he's going to talk to you about an artist who is giving away his album on a website in hopes that it will drive his concert sales. In the dark of graveyard chatter, in the light of freedom's call, in the heat of any matter, we travel as equals or not at all. Bloom disgust, class divide, I saw it written on the wall. The only way we can survive, we travel as equals or not at all. On this album you play all the instruments. Yeah, I played all the instruments, sort of like how I imagined Prince would do it or something. Really? Like Prince style. I always imagined him playing all the instruments. So. I mean, that's not why I played all the instruments, but... No, it, I mean, it, it works, and I, I actually had to <coughs> look twice to, to, to verify that you had played all the instruments. Yeah. Because sometimes, even with the best um, musicians who can play a lot of instruments, there's usually some sort of weak... Right. You know, they're not a good bass player, or they're yeah. not a good drummer or something, but yeah. it, 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 your own really works. Thanks. You know? I, well, I started out on bass, and I, I actually wanted to be a fusion bass player. Uh -huh. So I ended up working out a lot with a, um, a metronome and a click track, and bass is actually a good middle ground between sort of a rhythmic thing and melodic. So sure. from there I could play drums, and then I could, went into playing acoustic guitar, writing more sort of folky sort of songs. Did you always envision this as a, as a two-disc? No. Every time I make a record, I sort of have this idea that it's going to be a double record. And then always, at the last minute, I, I think better of it and pare it down into one and sort of think, okay, people don't want this much music or they can't, their attention span is, won't be able to handle it. So I usually always pare it down. But, um, and part of the reason why I put this one out immediately and for free was, was because I wanted it to be a double album and I wanted to give people the option to like either just download disc one if you want sort of the, a single record or, or here's the, what would have been left off in a way if, if you want both records. So. I wanted to capture it before I got afraid and, and pared it down right, and, right, and thought right. about it. That's kind of why I released it the way I did too, because I knew 
I, I was just, I knew it had this momentum and energy and I was still existing within it. And so often you put a record out and it's like six months old for you by the time you put it out. Mm -hmm. So you're not really in its space anymore and then you go and talk about it and you're not really yeah, yeah. there anymore. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to, this is the first time I'm like actually still with this record in a way, like mm -hmm. I'm still in, inside it. And I made it all in Brooklyn in my, in my home studio too, so. But, but, but free. You, you, you've given all this work away for free. What's the? I mean, you could have said, <coughs> "Pay what you want." Or well, it, 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 there's an option to donate, and people have donated. So it's uh, we've actually like you, you know done pretty well in that way. And uh, I mean, I think well, like we're living in this new sort of day of uh, of of trying to sort of uh, put our stuff out there and, and and get people to pay attention to it. So I think. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of experimental. It goes in. It's in line with the nature of the record, which I think is experimental and sort of. Uh, so I feel like it's all kind of a, the the sort of intention of the record is also in how it's being released in mm. a way. Mm. And and I, we're going to try to put it out in a traditional way as well. Like we're we have five new bonus tracks that we're going to put it out on iTunes. I see. And so we're we're kind of like making it up as we go. Yeah, I saw you on uh, Letterman, and you had a full band. Mm -hmm. uh, are you gonna tour with a full band? I would love that. That also, you know, the thing is, I can tour solo, um, and so it's it's a financial consideration, you know. But I would I would love to tour with a full band for sure. I've been touring the last couple of years solo, so right. I think it's time to play with a band again. 20 pounds, that is my weight on the moon, according to this cool exhibit here at the museum. Steak and ice cream for me this weekend. That probably was not on the menu of a lot of the models who are at New York's fashion shows this week. A lot there that was out of this world. Not too much, though, that was rustic and rural, except for the banjo player who was at the Levi's show. He's in our Odd Jobs segment. Take a listen. For New York Fashion Week, the Wall Street Journal is going beyond the runways and models to find the little noticed workers who make the glitzy event possible. My name is Morgan O'Kane. I play the banjo, suitcase. Have you ever been to a Fashion Week show? No. I used to build the benches for them, though. Really? Through Live Load, yeah. I used to do that for years and years. I've actually built benches in this room about 20 times. The banjo player was brought to me by a casting director, and the way she showed him to me was through a YouTube video, and I fell in love with it. When did you see this YouTube video? Um, just about three days ago, and I just kind of asked if she thought there's any way that he would play live. So live music and getting back to an intimate moment to me for the audience is really key to who we are and connecting with people in an emotional way. And I worked with some designers to design the runway that you're going to see today. How long is the runway? It is 160 feet. It's a long yeah. runway. I'd be winded, I think, if I had to go down the entire runway. The original idea is just based on the ritual of getting dressed and kind of the choices that you make in the morning when you want to feel a certain way, if you want to be empowered and kind of putting together your personal style as an attitude and a head-to-toe look and kind of going out and, and conquering the world. Well, the idea of the sidewalk is just the way to bring a, a very diverse collection together. Um, we have a very broad customer base and a lot of different styles and the street is one place where you see things come together in a, in a time that makes sense and so the chaos and the excitement and the fashion of the street and you'll actually see a fairly unconventional you know, walking situation that reflects kind of the excitement of being on the street and seeing all these varied styles. Don't like bluegrass? Well then how about jazz? Now where I'm standing here in the museum it might seem a little too high tech for the jazz age but we're going to help you channel your inner F. Scott Fitzgerald in this week's asset allocation.
That's it for WSJ Off Duty today. If you want to see more of the Northern Lights, you can click on some of the videos here on YouTube. In the meantime, please leave a comment below. Hit the like button if you like what you see. I'm Wendy Bounds. Join me on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll see you here tomorrow. In the meantime, we leave you with a parting glance at the Aurora Borealis.